Good evening. On behalf of Dean Hollerith and Bishop Buddy, welcome to Washington National Cathedral and tonight's Honest to God event. My name is Michelle Dibley. I'm the program director here at the cathedral. And we're so glad that you have joined us tonight for the first of this spring series. A very warm welcome in particular to our speakers tonight, Ms. Linda Early Chastang, Mr. Michael Collins, and Mr. John Meacham. We're so glad that you all are here with us tonight. We're especially grateful, actually, that we can be here in person, and we very much look forward to the day when we can welcome all of you back into this wonderful space to be with us for events like this. In recent years, our nation has been plagued by those who seek to tear down rather than to build up, to widen the divide instead of repairing the breach. As an institution at the intersection of our country's sacred and civic life, Washington National Cathedral seeks to convene important conversations about our civic and religious life. This spring, our Honest to God programs will lift up leaders who are people of faith, those who inspire in each of us greater faithful leadership. After tonight, we hope that you will join us for our two upcoming events. In April, we will have a conversation with Senate Chaplain Barry Black and House Chaplain Margaret Kibben, co-hosted with the National Institute for Civil Discourse. In May, Jose Andres will join us, and Dean Hollerith will host him and our canon missioner, Leonard Hamlin, for a conversation on leading from the heart. We hope you'll be with us. You can find out more at cathedral.org slash honest to God. Tonight, however, we begin with the life and leadership of Congressman John Lewis. And who better to recognize as a person of faith whose leadership inspired tens of thousands to leadership of their own. Last July, at the time of Congressman Lewis's death, Dean Hollerith said this, every so often, God gives us extraordinary individuals who spend their lives working for justice and promoting the way of love. John Lewis was just such a gift from God. He was a light in the darkness, a voice for the voiceless, a tireless champion for equality. Our guests tonight knew Congressman Lewis personally, and we're so pleased that they're here to share their reflections on his life and his leadership. Ms. Linda Early Chastang served as his chief of staff and counsel during his early years in office. She is currently the CEO of the John and Lillian Miles Lewis Foundation, which works to carry on the vision and work of Congressman Lewis. Her public service at Georgia State University College of Law the New Jersey Legislature and Hampton University confirmed for her that social justice and equity are the things most important to our nation and to her. Mr. Michael Collins served as Congressman Lewis's Chief of Staff, Floor Assistant, and Senior Advisor, working with the Congressman for more than two decades. He is a graduate of Morehouse College with an MBA from Emory University and an MSW from Boston College. Mr. Collins serves on multiple boards and is currently the board chair of the John and Lillian Miles Lewis Foundation. Finally, Mr. John Meacham is a renowned presidential historian, contributing writer to the New York Times Book Review, contributing editor at Time and Pulitzer Prize winning author. He is also the National Cathedral's canon historian-elect. He is the author of His Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope. And in just a few moments, we'll hear a reflection from Mr. Meacham to start our conversation this evening. Through tonight's conversation, and particularly the sharing of stories and experiences, we are inviting our guests to share their honesty, authenticity, and faith at a time when our country and our communities are in dire need of such a gift, and we're so grateful. So, in just a moment, 
I will offer an opening prayer. Mr. Meacham will offer a reflection on Congressman Lewis's leadership. And then for the bulk of our time together, Dean Hollerith will host our guests in conversation. During that time, we invite those of you who are watching at home to send your questions in either via the chat on YouTube or through the link that will be shared there. We would love to hear your questions, and I'll come back at the end of the conversation to share some of them with our panel so that they can answer them. So for those of you who are so inclined, won't you join me in a word of prayer? Holy God, we are grateful for your presence among us tonight in the cathedral and in the hearts of those listening wherever they may be. Bless our speakers as they so graciously share their reflections and experiences with us. Open our hearts and minds so that we may each hear something that helps us become the people you would call us to be. We thank you especially for the leadership of Congressman Lewis. And as the Most Reverend Michael Curry prayed last summer, may we, like him, rise up to claim the high call of love, never to cease laboring for a just and humane society and world, always showing compassion and daily, living humbly with God until all God's children are free. Amen, and I now invite Mr. Meacham to the second podium. Thank you, uh, Michelle, Reverend Dean, uh, Michael and Linda. I'm reminded of a story that Ronald Reagan used to tell when someone would call him when he was in Hollywood and say, would you come speak at a benefit? And Reagan would say, well, I, I can't sing or dance. Why would you want me? And they would say, well, you can introduce someone who can. So uh, I'm just here to, uh, to uh, as an opening act here. Uh, the story begins in Troy, Alabama, uh, Carter's Quarters, to be precise. Uh, John Lewis, for him, enslavement was not an abstraction. His great-grandfather had been born in uh, 1862, before the Emancipation Proclamation uh, freeing the enslaved people in the seceded states of the Union uh, went into effect on the 1st of January, 1863. So for him, America's original sin of human enslavement was as real as his great-grandfather, who uh, Frank Carter, who lived until the congressman was eight years old. The story truly begins with John Robert Lewis's first memory, which was of his mother's garden. It was the first and most iconic, in a way, of the many biblical realities and biblical landmarks that would mark the channels of John Lewis's life. I asked him uh, last spring, what was your first memory? And he paused and said, my mother's garden. I remember there was a bucket of water by the gate, and I always loved to help things grow. I always loved to help things grow. There were three tributaries, I think, that came together to form Congressman Lewis's life. One was the gospel of Jesus Christ. I never met anyone, actually, who was, in a way, less interested in denominational or sectarian politics or theological disputes uh, as, a, as a believer, as John Lewis. But his core insight, his core vision, was in fact that what was said in the Sermon on the Mount, what was said in that radical commandment first found in Leviticus, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves, and then taken to a farther extreme to love our enemies, he saw that commandment as a central controlling reality. I have never met anyone who closed the gap so precisely, so fully, between the profession of faith and its practice than John Robert Lewis. And he walked among us even unto last summer. I believe he was an American saint. I believe he meets all of the criteria for it. 
And I don't say that to make him a figure of stained glass or to put him on a pedestal far from uh, our reach. But you put people on a pedestal properly, I think, so it's easier to see them. It's easier for them to teach. He was willing to die for his vision of the country and of the world itself. We all know how many times he was willing to give everything for that. The 45 arrests, the innumerable uh, hours in custody. One of the miracles, and I use that word advisedly, is that he was arguably in more danger when we couldn't see him than when we could. The cameras were there on Highway 70 in Selma, Alabama. The cameras were there for the Freedom Rides. They were there for the sit-ins. They weren't there at Parchman. They weren't there in the penitentiaries, in the jails, where Lord knows what could have happened. But he always wanted to make things grow. And so, as one of the early church fathers said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And I would argue that the blood of John Lewis is the seed of our best manifestation of what America can be. So one was the faith. That was one tributary. I think another was his innate revulsion against the segregated order that he encountered in Troy. The first white person, the only white person he saw with any regularity growing up was the mailman. Uh, but when he would go into Troy, he had a revulsion against the fact that he was not fully a citizen. And it unsettled him in a profound and ultimately, for all of us, redemptive way. The third tributary, I think, is the story of the country itself. He was very much engaged in what was unfolding beyond Pike County. Uh, his family couldn't afford a uh, subscription to the newspaper. His grandfather got it, so he would get it a day or two later. He read about the Brown versus Board of decision of May 17th, 1954, and he waited all summer for his new white friends to come and join him. He misunderestimated, as George W. Bush would say, the uh, capacity of, of the Alabama white power structure to keep that from happening. He read about the death of Emmett Till in 1955. They were one year apart, and he knew that he could have been Emmett Till. He read about Authorine Lucy, who attempted to desegregate the University of Alabama in 1956 and was repelled from that. And in, I believe, December of 1956, the congressman always believed it was 1955. We disagreed. He was John Lewis, so believe him. But, uh, but I'm going to throw this in uh, as, as a biographer. December 1956, Martin Luther King preached a sermon called The Letter of Paul to the Christians in America. And as we know, Martin Luther King Jr. never met a metaphor he didn't like. And it was in a, a long homiletic uh, metaphor about what would the Apostle Paul say to the Christians in America. And what he would say, obviously, is that we were not living up to the injunction of Scripture in either its letter or its spirit. And John Lewis heard that over the radio. And Martin Luther King became, in that moment, a kind of father figure to him. The only time uh, on record that uh, John Lewis, a devoted apostle of nonviolence, which he learned from Jim Lawson in the basement of the Clark Memorial United Methodist Church in Nashville in the late 1950s, the only time he ever raised a hand back was in the Albert Hotel in Selma, Alabama, when a white supremacist, uh, uh, American Nazi, part of the um, Lincoln Rockwell group, came after Martin Luther King. And John Lewis's reaction was to defend Dr. King. But he defended him not with a fist, but with a hug. He threw his arms around the assailant to protect Dr. King. So I think these three things, I think the, the faith itself, the innate revulsion against segregation, and the sense that he was not alone, 
that's how he decided that he could help make things grow. He comes to Nashville, Tennessee uh, in the fall of 1957. Uh, the Little Rock desegregation crisis is unfolding. He wanted to come back to Alabama to desegregate uh, the largest university near him, Troy State. Uh, that's the first time he met Dr. King. But his parents didn't want him to do it. And it's another biblical mark. Jesus said, if you are going to follow me, you have to give up your family. You have to give up the ordinary conventions and customs of life because the coming of the kingdom is of such scope and such immensity that it requires a new orientation in life. Another biblical note is he was not John Lewis when he was growing up. He was Robert Lewis or Bob. And when he came to Nashville, another biblical note, he goes to a hill. He goes to a mountain, American Baptist Theological Seminary on the Cumberland River, on a, it was called the Holy Hill, and he received a different work. He received a different commission. And like Abraham, like Elijah, like Peter, he received a different name. And his friends began to call him John. And so John Lewis was this figure who was connected to the young boy who had learned so much in Troy and who had begun, as all of us did, in a garden. He became a commissioned, ordained apostle of what Lincoln called our better angels. And John Lewis was a better angel. And that, as an angel, he wanted to help make things grow. He becomes engaged in the civil rights movement in this city. First time he came to Washington was in uh, May of 1961 when he boarded a bus for the Freedom Rides. Uh, he had made his mark in the sit-ins of Nashville. He had been arrested. He saw it as a kind of baptism by fire. He said he'd never felt, and this is a New Testament image, he had never felt as free as when he was jailed for the first time in Nashville in 1960. His whole life was about growth, and it was about reversal. It was about upending the ordinary conventions and understandings of power and politics and dominion and supremacy in the service of a biblically informed, theologically driven understanding of what the Declaration of Independence actually meant, what that self-evident truth actually meant. And he never flinched. And that's the remarkable, remarkable thing. He had a wilderness period in the mid-1960s. Uh, he went to New York. He was uh, trying to get his footing, but it was fairly brief. He was brought back into it, brought back into the, the maelstrom of history after Selma, both by Dr. King's speech at the Riverside Church on the Vietnam War and by Robert Kennedy's uh, presidential campaign in 1968, when he saw the capacity of politics to help close that gap between profession and practice. He saw a way to make things grow. A word about his sainthood. Uh, he always resisted this, um, but I have Jim Lawson on my side, and so I'm going to take it and run. Uh, if Jim Lawson tells you that if something's okay, you're, you're in good shape. Uh, the saintliness is, again, not to elevate him above the realm of human experience. Saints are not saviors. Saints are not gods. They are godlike. They are savior-like. They are not perfect. They're just a hell of a lot better than the rest of us, which if you're me, it's not very hard. But, you know, as Robert Louis Stevenson once said, it's the duty of the Christian not to succeed but to fail cheerfully. John Lewis succeeded cheerfully, reversing that insight of Robert Louis Stevenson's. To tell his story, to be in conversation with John Lewis, is to be in conversation with the deepest, deepest truths of the human experience as informed by our 
imperfect understanding of the divine. We see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. I think John Lewis saw through that glass, into that glass, more clearly than anyone else I've ever known. I've been lucky in my, uh, my life. Uh, Michelle kindly called me a renowned presidential historian. I must say that's like being described as the best restaurant in a hospital. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you want to win, but it's not that hard. Um, but I've known three people really well uh, in public life. One was buried from this place, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. The other is the incumbent president of the United States, Joe Biden. And the other is John Lewis. And there's three wildly different people, right? A son of Greenwich, uh, Andover and Yale, World War II hero, uh, a man of immense privilege, uh, George Bush, a Roman Catholic working class guy from Scranton and Claymont, Joe Biden, and the great grandson of an enslaved person who challenged a nation's conscience and pushed us toward a more perfect union through the power of love, not hate, hope, not fear, creativity and creation and growth, not destruction. But they have one thing in common, and that was a remarkable capacity for empathy. They saw the world and see the world through other people's eyes, which I would argue is fundamentally biblical. To love your neighbor as yourself is really hard. I'm not all that interested in loving my neighbor as myself. I like my neighbor, that's fine, you know. And I certainly don't want to love my enemy. You know, Jesus, they're my enemy, that's the point, right? But the witness and life of John Robert Lewis is that what I just said is wrong. And he embodied, manifested, and taught us that to meet hate with love and darkness with light is not just ideal, but possible. And in that way, we can all help make things grow. Thank you. You got to bring that with you, John. I think you've heard from me plenty. <laughs> Thank you, John, for that. That was wonderful. Uh, I love the, the, how you kept coming back to making things grow. It's so true. And, and Linda and Michael, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We're honored to have all three of you here, but especially um, with all the work you have done on John Lewis and all the history you two have with him, to be able to have this conversation is um, very special. And I do want to put a shameless plug in. If you have not read John's book on John Lewis, you should. I will honestly say it's one of the best books I have read in the past year and has been um, very deeply uh, meaningful to me uh, during this pandemic as I think about um, all the things I'm not doing in my cozy, snug, comfortable home and reading about all the things that John Lewis did with his life, which was so amazing. So, um, canon, elect, historian, John Meacham. It's a sign of the end of Christendom. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, you, don't get to, you don't get to hear that title very often, do you, no, no, Canon no, Elect? John has been kind enough to agree to serve as the first Canon Historian of Washington National Cathedral, and until he is seated officially in that role, he's Canon Elect. So it's great, it's great to have you with us. And friends, we miss having you in the building. I must say it's nice for us to be in the building, although there's, a, as you can imagine, an amazing echo in here. Uh, but we look forward to a ch time when all of us can be back together in this space for wonderful occasions like this and for um, celebrating services and seating John Meacham as canon-elect, uh, our historian-elect will be a great event. So let me just start with the two of you all. Would you all tell, tell us, Linda, Michael, each of you tell us about when you were with John, your years, because I want to make sure people understand that completely your years with him, um, during what parts of his life, and then um, say, I'd love to have all three of you say a little bit about 
um, a couple of the things that you learned from him that were most important to you. And I know you both have really interesting stories about how you met him or, or the first times you met him. So that would be great to share as well. Well, I met John Lewis when I was, I thought it was 14, I think it may have been 12, uh, at a small Presbyterian church here in Washington uh, where the minister was the president of the Washington, D.C. chapter of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, I had an occasion to meet Martin Luther King, Bayard Rustin, uh, my memory isn't as good as it used to be, James Farmer, uh, Stokely Carmichael, as he was then known, and then, of course, John Lewis. Um, I met him the next time when I was in Atlanta, maybe 15 years later. I first met his wife, Lillian, we became friends, and she pulled me into John's campaign for city council. And I worked on that campaign. We hosted a couple of coffees back in, I don't know what the year was. But I followed his career as I had done previously when he was on the council because he was very interested in things that were important to me, neighborhood preservation and ethics. Those were his hallmarks on the council. Of course, when he decided to run for, for Congress, I wanted to be there with him then. Um, that was sort of an interesting story because he ran against his old friend, Julian yes. Bond. And at that time, the talk was that all of the Buppies in town were behind Julian. Buppies are the uh, black urban young professionals or something like that. And so my husband and I hosted a fundraiser. Uh, we didn't raise a lot of money, but we had 100 people who would, you would call puppies in our home to show support for John Lewis. Um, then my husband took a position here in Washington and I called the congressman and said, look, I'm moving to Washington. I wanna come help you change the world. And he said, come in, let's talk about it. And he offered me a job as administrative assistant. And I said, that's fine, I'll do that. You know, with my two law degrees, I'm happy to be administrative assistant if I can help you change the world. I did not know, and I know this is hard to believe, until I showed up for work a couple of weeks later that the AA, the administrative assistant, was the chief of staff. <laughs> so that was my, um, that's how I began Surprise. my work career with the congressman. Mm -hmm. Well, Linda had a big part of me uh, joining the congressman's staff, but before then I had an opportunity to meet the congressman when I was a freshman at Morehouse College. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had several speakers come in to uh, address the freshman and orientation once a week. And Congressman Lewis uh, availed himself and all of his knowledge and experience and compassion for, for being a freshman and uh, extend an invitation for us to keep in touch with him throughout our matriculation. And uh, just always wanted to be available. So I did not take that opportunity until my senior year <laughs> at Morehouse uh, when I was just about ready to graduate and had an opportunity to um, asked the congressman for a letter of recommendation, which he gave me, and a wonderful pen uh, for graduation, and, uh, and sent me off uh, to uh, Boston. I ended up returning home to Boston, where I uh, taught and uh, directed youth programs for the city of Boston. Relative about five years later, um, Senator Kennedy was hosting a book signing for Congressman Lewis at the Harvard Club. And I had heard about it and shared with all my colleagues that, oh, I know John Lewis. I know Congressman Lewis. Um, they're like, really? I said, yeah. I said, um, I met him years when I was in college. I said, oh, wow, what's he like? And I hadn't spoken to the congressman in five years. <laughs> but I was surely going to make sure <laughs> that everybody knew I had a, had, had a connection with the congressman. Uh, had an opportunity to get invited uh, to the luncheon and um, stood in the back of the room because I was going to wait for my opportunity to reintroduce myself to the congressman. And uh, the doors of the, of the room opened, and the congressman saw me in the corner of the room and bolted directly over to me and said, where have you been? <laughs> and I said, you remember me? <laughs> he said, how could I forget you? And I was like, Phew. I was then relieved. <laughs> my friends and everyone could then champion on with me. But that was the beginning and the reconnection that I had with the congressman. Uh, Linda came into part where she um, was a conduit which I uh, was able to join the congressman's staff um, at that moment. Um, that, that year I was finishing up at uh, Boston College with my master's in social work. So what year would that have been? That was in 1998. 98, gotcha. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. So y'all say a little bit about, I'm just gonna jump into the big stuff. I mean, say a little bit about some things that were really important to you that you learned from John Lewis. And even you, John, during your time with him, you all must have some things that are important for us to know about the man that you, that you learned from him. He was, I think, the, the central figure in 20th and 21st century American life, and I include Dr. King in this, um, who closed this gap between profession and practice of faith in the public square, mm. not in a sectarian way. Uh, again, I, he had no interest in denominational stuff. Um, but the Bible said, love your neighbor. Jim Lawson had shown him how to be nonviolent in the most violent of situations. Remember, you're, talk, you're talking about what John Lewis fought as a young man, as a very young man. Right? So he's, he's born in uh, 1940, right? February 21st, 1940. And so he's 25. He's barely turned 25 when he's on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But that's, in a way, the, the capstone of that period of his life, a, a life with many chapters. He starts in his teens in Nashville. And he was taught this remarkable set of convictions, and Jim Lawson was vital. Uh, Lawson, uh, I think, is probably the most important American that not enough people know. Uh, he was a son of a Methodist minister, a Methodist minister. He went to jail for conscientious objection during the Korean War. He goes to India. He was too late to meet Gandhi, but he met a lot of Gandhi's lieutenants, absorbed the tactics of that movement, comes back. He runs into King at Oberlin. They're just both having to be visiting. And King realizes the set of experiences that Dr. Lawson has, and he says, you're the kind of person we need in the South. And so Lawson said, okay. And he comes to Nashville and he teaches Diane Nash and Bernard Lafayette and John Lewis and uh, just becomes really the architect of the struggle against white supremacist state-sanctioned violence. He wrote the guiding principles for SNCC, didn't he? When, yeah. when it was first formed. Yeah, and it was wear a coat and tie. Uh, it's say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. Uh, it was all about putting the onus on the oppressor and illustrating with raw physical courage that there was a right and there was a wrong. And the system and the laws were on the wrong side. And so what I learned from him, uh, which is in no way novel, uh, is that in that pulpit, uh, on what, March 30th, 31st, 1968, Dr. King quoted Theodor Parker saying, the arc of a moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. That's fine. What John Lewis taught me is that the arc of a moral universe does not bend unless there are people like John Lewis insisting that it swerve. And in that tension is American democracy. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, I, w I would say that, you know, living, um, well, Linda and I, 30 years of what you've outlined, I mean, we show up every day with them. Right. And, yeah. you know, I, I just, for me, I've always thought about, um, you know, looking at the congressman and, and seeing all of those things that were just so true to him and his, his beliefs of home, his faith. I would say that, you know, his work in, in Congress and his work in the Civil Rights Movement was an extension of his faith and that he lived that every day. Uh, his family was so very important to him. Um, and, you know, he was not very different than that little boy from Troy every day. In, in Congress walking those halls and the respect that he gave to every single person, um, whether it was a police officer when he thanked them for his service, whether it was the teller 
whether it was the lady on the elevator. <laughs> I mean, he lived his life every day with true meaning and principle. And, you know, as a young staffer, well, I guess I wasn't that young, but uh, when, as a staffer, you're focused on the task at hand, and that is getting the congressman to where he needs to go and making sure that he's on time and meeting those needs and requirements. And none of that was in the congressman's head. It was not <laughs> anything he focused on. What he focused on was individuals with people, mm -hmm. the people he came in contact walking those halls, the everyday people that walked the halls in Congress, the street, um, the airport. I mean, that's the, those were the lessons. Those are the lessons that we wonderfully had. You know, every day we're with him. I spent 21 years working with him. And every day was a lesson. I say he woke up every day as if it was a brand new day and with a new meaning. And he took nothing for granted. And that was a lesson that you just, you know, again, you've, you've studied, you understood it in a different context. But we had a way to, to live it out every day. I'm sure you have thousands of these stories. But um, I remember walking through an air, maybe in Chattanooga, walking through an airport with him. And a woman ran up to him and said, oh my God, I'm going to faint. And he said, please don't faint. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he was funny, too. <laughs> John, I read your book um, over the weekend, and I was reminded in reading it um, that John was, until his last days, the same person he was as a boy in Troy. And reading the epilogue, I believe, is where I got that... It, I was reminded that you have core values where you should, and you should always, always have those top of mind, and they should guide your steps. I think that's what John did, John Lewis did. He had core, simple, or he would have said, plain values, and he stuck with them. Peace was important. Nonviolence was important. Love was important knowledge was important, being creative, being thoughtful. Those things were just who he was from the, be the very beginning to the end. You know, I said that I met him at my small Presbyterian church here, and we had a very small congregation, a very small church, a very small fellowship hall. But I can remember John and others spending time with young people in that fellowship hall drinking lemonade because he thought it was important to inspire or engage with young people. And that's, as you very well know, that's something that was important to him until the very, very end, um, when Michael took him to Black Lives Matter Plaza. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that he was determined to do that, he did it, and he had an important message for those who would follow in his footsteps and for others who, are, who may not know that they need to follow in his footsteps. You know, the, uh, we've been talking, uh, our focus for the spring is servant leadership. Um, as we move into this new administration, and we've been through so many difficult days and leadership in our country or challenging days, and uh, we thought it was an important time to lift up a different kind of leadership, a uh, kind of leadership that comes out of the, of, that the church lifts up in the life of Jesus. And the servant leader is the one, is the leader who first and foremost is not interested in the trappings of power, but it's interesting in serving the people for whom they are supposed to lead. And I just can't think of a better example of that in his life than, than John Lewis. And what I'm curious to ask you all, if you have an insight, as I was reading John's book and as I've known about um, John Lewis's life, you know, to be so young, as you mentioned, you know, barely 25 years old when he's on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, or even younger when he's doing the sit-ins or the freedom rides, uh, all the arrests, the beatings, the spitting, the, you know, the, the stances he took, the courage that he showed, the things that he put up with over and over and over and over again, out of that love, out of that sense of, I'm going to, we're going to love our way through this. And then to see I guess I'm moving quickly here, but then to see Martin Luther King killed, and then to see Robert Kennedy killed. And did he ever get jaded? Did you ever see him jaded? Did you ever see him lose? I mean, it's one thing when you're that young to hold on to those kind of ideals, but the fact that he did it through 45, you know, 
45 imprisonments or arrests and uh, is, is amazing. But in all the years you're with him, did, did he ever appear jaded? No, no, not at all. Um, he was the most optimistic person that I've ever met. Um, he never was jaded. Um, he got up and he forged ahead. And he talked about losing Dr. King and, and, and Bobby Kennedy. And he just recommitted himself, you know, to doing their work and the other work and the work that was important to him. Um, but it was, it was a very sad and dark time for him. But he just kept forging ahead and, and he lived out his life making sure that he touched people and changed, you know, the things that he could. But no, he never was jaded and never felt like there was something that was going to keep him back. Um, he inspired his colleagues um, every day in Congress. Uh, they looked to him, you know, and so he really, um, he felt positive and, and confident in that, in that leadership. And he wanted us to always be positive. Mm -hmm. Linda, hold, your, hold up a little closer. I'm sorry, excuse me. He wanted us to always be positive, always be optimistic, always be hopeful, stay focused, pace yourself. It'll happen. Slow down, Linda. We'll get there. The one wilderness period was in the late 60s, the New York phase, um, but remarkably brief. Uh, a little bit longer than 40 days, but... And that's but, when he meets his wife, isn't it, during that period? That's a little bit later. A little bit um, later. But he... Uh, I, was, I was struck by something that Michael and Linda said about the trappings of power. The first time I met him was on election night in a Georgia Senate runoff, everything old is new again, uh, <laughs> in 1992. And one of the key things about an election night as Linda and Michael know extremely well, is a measure of power is not being seen. Now, you're really just eating cheese cubes in a different room, but you, you want to be seen as though you're an ancient priest uh, communing, you know, with, with uh, the precincts and all that. And I walked into this hotel ballroom, and he and Lillian were just standing there talking to me. And it was the, the absolutely unassuming, absolutely authentic, uh, in no way, it was not a showy kind of in, uh, authenticity, which you, you can sometimes see. Uh, but I think that's part of the sainthood argument, is that in the face of reaction, of ongoing, unfolding, unto this hour attacks on the work that he almost gave his life for and his friends did give their lives for, I mean, what are we debating right now in this city? Voting rights. What's happening in Atlanta right now? Voting rights. And yet, my, as an as a observer from afar, one of the things that was so amazing was that he was truly, as St. Paul said, patient in tribulation. Mm -hmm. And Linda said and, and, that the core values were, were, were simple, and that's true, but my God, they're so hard to hold on to. I mean, I'm terrible at it. <laughs> so it, it, it's just inc that, that he did hold on. And he never lost them. And never lost them. He lived it. it every day. Yeah. Did you, did you too, did you all see examples of, um, I'm trying to think of grace that may have unfolded years later. You know, you hear the stories of um, a policemen who beat him or uh, folks who attacked him or uh, various. Did you, see, did you see a grace come out of that? Did you all ever witness times when um, people would, someone would come up to him and apologize? I mean, years later was, um, I would hope that there would be some, um, some grace and some healing or some experiences there of redemption for some others. Did you all witness any of that? Definitely. I mean, he believed in redemption and people, um, you know, uh, Elwin Wilson comes to mind. Elwin, Elwin Wilson comes to mind in North Carolina. From Rock Hill. From Rock Hill. And uh, his, uh, after the election of uh, President Obama, um, he was witnessing um, all that was taking place and he told his son he had confessed to his son uh, what he had been participating in back in uh, those days at Rock Hill, and had confessed that he was one of the ones who had beaten the congressman. 
And his son then took the story to the local news station. Uh, the local news station made contact with our office and asked if the congressman would want to meet with him. Mm -hmm. And of course, again, knowing the congressman, he of course would want to meet with him. And so they came uh, early one morning and a room, his son and uh, Mr. Wilson, and uh, this is all recorded on, on, on news. And they, they met together and Mr. Wilson asked the congressman for his forgiveness. Mm. And the congressman, without hesitation, said, I forgive you. And they hugged, embraced for a very long time, and that was true. And the congressman believed and felt in his heart that forgiveness because he had nothing, he held nothing toward him. And so that was the beginning of their relationship. And they spent several times together after that um, just talking about that story. Well, that must and have to been be so clear. This, this was a Klansman who had beaten him at Rock mm -hmm. Hill, South Carolina in 1961. Was this in the bus station? Was this yeah. that? Mm -hmm. that, right. yeah. mm. that must have been a powerful a moment to witness. It was. It actually was, yes. Yes. So tell us a little bit more like what he was like to, to work for. Uh, you were telling us. So I imagine, I imagine it was not easy to get him onto his schedule. He was going to stop and chat. Well, Linda had the early time to do this. I had to follow behind her. <laughs> he had his own schedule, let's put it that way. And, it, and the biggest thing that would get in the way were young people. You know, I. After John passed last year, I got a call from a young man who called to say that he had been an intern when I was there and what a difference it had made in his life and how he couldn't have imagined that he would have had the opportunity that he had to spend time with the congressman. And I'm thinking, yeah, there was something else I really wanted him to do. But that was important to him. He was very generous with time. The most precious thing we have on earth, time and he would give it away. Uh, so, so no, you know, he, he got where he needed to go when he needed to be there, so it was okay. <laughs> yeah, he must have been doing something right all those years yeah, in absolutely, Congress. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it's funny, John talks about uh, the congressman being a saint, and so of course he never, never brought it up. And, unless one day we're in the car and he'll say, remember, I'm a saint. <laughs> Said, okay. <laughs> okay, say, <saint>. right. <laughs> oh, there were those ago, few moments. Years ago, uh, probably to maybe late 90s, early 2000s, uh, late Saturday afternoon, one of, the, one of the ways we got to know each other is, is he was very generous about doing op-eds. And I, I was in journalism then, and something had happened. I can't remember what. And um, I called the home number in, in Atlanta, and Mrs. Lewis answered. And I said, ma'am, I'm sorry to bother you, but I, is the congressman around? She said, honey, he's at a black church banquet. He won't be back till Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, was, it was always, but he, nev and he never, I mean, Michael and Linda were both incredibly adept at this. He never said no. Right. I mean, if there were an invit, I mean, if there were an invitation, if there was a something to do, he was there to tell that story. And one of the things that this is a, a liturgical mind would appreciate this. When you think about the annual pilgrimages to Selma and Montgomery and Birmingham, you took members of Congress for how long? Twenty years, more, longer. You, most of the time when you are engaged in acts of commemoration, you're also engaged in acts of self-aggrandizement, just by the nature of it. And yet, he could take you to the place where he and Hosea Williams and Amelia Boynton made the Voting Rights Act happen, where the tear gas was, the concussion was inflicted, and you would not think in any way that it was not the most natural thing in the world, but that you were there with John Lewis. Mm -hmm. There was, it was this remarkable capacity, I've never figured it out, to tell a story in which he was a central character 
without self-reference. Mm -hmm. mm. It was magical and mysterious. But when you were standing there with him, it wasn't that it was about him. You were just thrilled that you were there with this person who had done this. The other thing I think we should mention, uh, because it's a whole different generation, two generations now, I guess, are the graphic novels mm -hmm. about the march, which has, I know my children first encountered the movement through that. Um, and of course, one of the reasons he did is he'd had a comic book about the bus boycott. Dr. King. Yeah. The Montgomery story, I think right. it was called. Right. Those were amazingly successful, weren't they? The comic book, yeah. the graphic novels. And, and when I first heard about those, I, didn't, I couldn't imagine that they would be, but they were. He was right about that. I mean, they were very successful. And the story that you know, we worry about for these generations that these stories get lost, they, they, don't, they don't get told. And they're and so important that they, that, they, uh, that they continue to get told. So tell, tell us about, we were talking about the Pettis, uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge. Tell us a little bit about, um, what did John think about um, uh, the protest this past summer, the Black Lives Matter protest, the, um, all, the, all the folks out on the street. Uh, it's the first time in many a decade that we have seen uh, the sort of reaction that we've seen in the past year and racism raising its head and making how clear it's still a serious issue in this country and so many thousands of people stepping out about it. And what did he think of, of this, these most recent movements? So this is a difficult time. This is a difficult time. I mean, a congressman had been diagnosed in December and um, was going through treatment in January. Um, John, to his credit, was really, um, we were able to have the opportunity to get the congressman to talk with John through, through some of that time. Um, and the congressman, as you know, who he is, who we're talking about today, just wasn't able to come out and talk in ways that he normally would be able to. Normally, I mean, we normally hear him and he would be on the floor or we would be writing and you would see it in print. Um, everything was internal for him. And so it was very frustrating. And he just didn't have the opportunity to be vocal, but you could see it. He did not turn the TV off, MSNBC. <laughs> Every time John was on, he's like, John, 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 John. <laughs> Um, but this was, it was very personal. He couldn't express himself like he wanted to. And um, I had an opportunity to, um, he wanted to go home to Atlanta to visit um, home his son. I drove him to Atlanta. And um, this was right after um, the killing. Um, and he um, was very sad. I walked in the room and he was crying. Mm. And I said to him, I said, what is the matter? And of course, everything on George Floyd, the news was just reeling. And he said, this is just so sad. And I said, I know, Congressman. I said, we have, you know, we made a list of all of the requests. There are over 100 requests for him to speak. And I had them all outlined. And I said, we have a whole list of them for you to speak. And he just shook his head and said, I can't. Um, it was very internal for him. He was dealing with his own you know, demise and just thinking about how he could and didn't really want to go public. He didn't want to be seen. Um, but it was just a very difficult time for him. And as you can imagine how difficult that was, just knowing who he is. And so we did have an opportunity to get him on camera. He did a couple of interviews. Um, but the one which Linda made reference to um, was, which we didn't know at the time, would be his last public appearance was uh, he had an opportunity to see the unveiling of the Black Lives Matter Plaza. It's such a powerful photograph of him standing there. And um, in the midst of his illness, this was literally a month or so just before he passed, um, he said, I want to go see it. And I said, we will go see it. Not thinking that I really would take him, or maybe drive him by on the way to treatment. And then I thought, this really means something to him. This is really the opportunity for him to really feel and be a part in the connection to everything that had been going on and identifying with all these young people because as Linda in indicated, young people, I mean, this was his life. I mean, they were, they're the future. And he always believed the young people who took the time to sit and, and meet with them 
And so young people and, and, and the diversity and the commitment and just watching them. And like I said, that's the one he did not, he did not do. He did not turn off that TV. He would lay there and watch it. So he watched the footage over and over again. And he said, I want to go to the Black Lives Matter Plaza. And so we were able to arrange for him to go early, early on a Sunday morning with nobody being there. And that was the moment that he reconnected with the movement. He couldn't be out, with, out there with them, but being on the street there was a symbol of a unification for what they were doing, what they had done, and their future, and that he connected with it. One of the things that I've always thought is interesting, and I remember the congressman saying this, you use your body to make the statement if you need to. And he certainly did that in many of the ways that you recounted in your book, John. Uh, but that was another such um, occasion. He didn't say anything at Black Lives Matter Plaza. He stood there. But boy, what a powerful, powerful message to the folks that were there and those who couldn't be there. It was really like a bridge between the activists of his generation and the activists of the next generation. I mean, I, that symbolism of a bridge is just so powerful, and he used it in so many, many ways. But um, that was an occasion when I called Michael. I didn't know they were going. I called Michael, and I said, Michael, why are you taking John down there to Black Lives Matter? Play? You know he can't do that. And Michael said, Linda, you know I can't stop him. <laughs> he was committed to doing that, and it was, you know, he made so many creative and smart decisions about how best to move the movement, and that was one such occasion. And you're right, it was, it was, uh, it was incarnational, wasn't it? I mean, it was about him physically being in that space, as, as you said, and that picture is such a, you know, I was looking at the picture in John's book, um, and when he's looking so frail, and yet he's masked and standing in the middle of the plaza, and it's, it's very powerful. So I know we've got lots of questions from the people who are watching, so we'll get ready to take some of those. But before we do that, so tell us a little bit about what the foundation is, uh, is up to. Well, Michael and I are working hard to build the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm really excited. In fact, today was a very exciting day. I just feel very positive about where we're headed. But our job is, and I think John left us a blueprint for this, is to keep doing what he would have us do, telling the stories, teaching, uh, providing support, being inspired, just as he was by Jim Lawson and Martin Luther King. Um, and then to inspire others, which is what he has always done uh, particularly these of the young people. So we are a new organization. Um, we are developing uh, much faster than I would have expected, and I'm just terribly, terribly excited. And what I know is that John is very proud of the work that we're doing, Michael. <laughs> I agree. Yes. Will the pilgrimages continue? I'm sure they will in some form or fashion, definitely. Through faith and politics. Yeah, they're so important. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to invite uh, Michelle to come back up. And she and Margaret have been keeping an eye on uh, folks on the internet writing in. And so we'll see if we can take some of those questions. Yeah. So um, I can also let you all know that there are more than 500 people who are watching on YouTube. So um, we're so grateful that you get to share all of this with so many folks. They're from all over the country. So um, Maryland and Alabama and Tennessee and a couple of folks from Vermont. So there's, there's just people who are, like I said, all over. Um, Linda, one of the questions to you is if you would be willing to share some stories of uh, his time at Martha's Vineyard. So I don't know if you. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yep, if you could share some stories about his time at Martha's Vineyard, if you all spent some time up there. Well, he, he's visited several times. Um, most recently, he was there for an event with C.T. Vivian. Was that the last time, I think it was? And he and C.T. Vivian, um, who, who, by the way, as you may know, passed on the very same day that John did. Mm. And um, I was actually on the phone with his daughter, and she was saying, 
Linda, I just don't think we're going to make it through the weekend. And then I got a call from Michael, and she called it. So um, they together uh, talked about their experiences in the movement. We had an overflow crowd, as we have on the other occasions. I actually promoted his book, Walking with the Wind. So we did a couple of summer events there back in 1998 and 1990. And in fact, that's where I met Michael. <laughs> oh, tell us that story. I'm sorry. Tell us that story. Did the, the two of you met at just one of the one of those events? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so L Linda he was responsible. He got books out of my car for me. They were too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I had the wonderful assignment. Lin, Linda called and said, I have an assignment for you. And your assignment is um, to drive the congressman back to Boston um, to catch his flight from Martha's Vineyard. And uh, in order to do that, you have to get here <laughs> to Martha's Vineyard. And you've got to do a few things while you're here. And so uh, that's what I did. That was, uh, that was the book signing. Uh, it was actually the 35th anniversary of the March on Washington. Um, President Clinton, Charles Ogletree, Anita Hill, and Martin Luther King III. Were, and my daughter, Rebecca Chastain. <laughs> we're, paying, we're paying tribute to the congressman uh, for the 35th anniversary. And that was when uh, doc, um, excuse me, President Clinton uh, came and read from his book at, at uh, the church. I uh, can't remember the church, yes. But my assignment was to turn the pages as, <laughs> as the books got signed. <laughs> but it was an incredible honor, and, and I enjoyed it. And He's exaggerating. No. Michael was extremely helpful. The other thing that's interesting about that particular event is that that is when President Clinton acknowledged or did his mea culpa around Monica Lewinsky. Mm -hmm. So it, the event turned out to event? be something. Yeah. That, was his first, that was his first public appearance after the Monica Lewinsky scandal, right. and he had called Congressman Lewis mm -hmm. and told the congressman that he did not think he'd be able to make it. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. congressman said, um, Mr. President, you were my friend mm -hmm. before, you're my friend after, That's right. and I expect you to be there. Mm -hmm. And he was there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Boy, walking history this is. It's amazing. So a couple of people have asked questions about the young folks that Congressman Lewis was so interested in. So I'm going to ask both the questions and then I'm going to sort of frame it a little bit. So Maisie is asking, what can we do to cultivate leadership in our children's teens and young adults? And where's the other one? And Buck is wondering how he works with college students, young people, and is would like to hear more of how can we help our unemployed neighbors rather than I have to have my spring break trip. So the way that I want to frame this is what did you hear John Lewis say to young people when he was in conversation with them as he was so often? What was his message? What would he invite those young people to hear or say or do that our listeners might pass on to the young people? that they're working with? Well, I would say, I, I've had this wonderful opportunity every year. I look forward to it, and it's the commencement seasons. And so I always made sure that I was on the schedule to travel with him to every single commencement, because it was always exciting. Um, but I think the best way that I could think about that question would be the congressman would often say in his commencement addresses, to find something so meaningful Help me, Linda, with this, because he, he would say, find something so meaningful and so necessary that you take yourself out of your own circumstances and concern yourself with the circumstances of others. It was really a prescription for servant leadership, mm. where you are, you, something is, well, you've said it, I'm sorry, I don't have any, another way to put it, but it is, to me, what servant leadership is about, where you are promoting the community or other people as opposed to yourself, something that means more to you than you mean to you. And that should be, if it goes back to those core values, find them, stick with them, um, never lose sight of them, let them be your guide always. Just get involved. Just find something so meaningful that you believe in 
and just go for it, he would say. That was his favorite slogan, go for it. He would tell everybody, go for it. Anything you want I'm to add? in. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> uh, okay, there's some really great, just trying to figure out what order to pull these into. So you all have talked, but none of us are going to be John Lewis, presumably. We're not yet, so we're presumably not going to get there. Uh, but there's a question here about how you all were encouraged by him. So in other words, John Lewis was an extraordinary human who encouraged other people to be extraordinary. And you all spent time with him in close proximity. So what did he do for you that you try to do for others? So in other words, what are, the, are there habits, are there practices, are there ways that you encourage others or are around other people based on what you learn from him? For me, it would be um, teaching and encouraging others. You know, I enjoy, I feel it's my responsibility to share with young people. Um, I learn from them an awful lot more today than before, <laughs> especially around technology as an example. But the, the responsibility to teach and encourage others is something I learned from him. I, I would say, uh, respect um, for other people. Just, you know, your fellow man, just respect for other people and, and respecting their worth, their dignity, he would say all the time, and just really um, making sure that you extend yourself, you know, a, a helping hand. Literally all of the principles that we've talked about uh, early on and John has talked about, just really being there and being a servant and a connection to somebody else that you don't know and really respecting them. So I think that that's really. I'm not a good enough person to, to, to teach or, or, or inspire people, but I will say this. I think I would have had a very different and darker view of the present and future of our democracy over the last five years, if not for John, if not for his example. I believed all through 2015 to 2020 that we would, in fact, overcome. And as I think back why I thought that, part of it is, I think, historically and theologically, so I'm really fun to hang out with. Uh, but American history is a series of provisional victories. And those victories are innately provisional because our experience shows us you go across the Pettus Bridge, but George Wallace wins 13.5% in five states in the 1968 presidential election, right? You, you beat off McCarthy, you beat off Wallace, and you get what happened to the country from 2016 to 2020. There are recurrent dark forces in American life that have to be met by recurrent forces of light. And in our midst, there was an exemplar of someone who was willing to die for that idea. And this isn't, if we were talking about St. Paul or something, you know, it would, it would be sort of theoretical and that's what you're supposed to do in a setting like this. He was your friend. He was your mentor. I loved him uh, from afar. And he was with us eight months ago, well, whatever it is, within the last year. So here was this person who carried in him the resilience and the tragedy and the triumph of America itself. And that's the story that has to be told again and again. And I'm convinced that one of the reasons for the graphic novel, one of the reasons for the picture, for always, as, you, as Linda was saying, he always knew how to frame what was going on, is that he had 
engaged, he had encountered American history that way, through the radio, through the Troy Messenger, through the Montgomery Advertiser. Um, you know, Julian Bond's job was to handle the press. And that wasn't for self-aggrandizement, it was to educate and to tell that story. And the story, I think, ultimately, of John Robert Lewis is that America, for all of its tragedies, can in fact prevail, as hard as it is. So I'm gonna jump in real quick, because I got a question I'm dying to answer, given what I've been hearing here a little bit. So forgive me, folks out there, but I, if Congressman Lewis was standing here today, right now, and I was to say to him, uh, Congressman, what are the most important things for us to be doing right now as a nation to really take on and, and push back and battle against systemic racism in this country? What should we be doing? What, what do you think he would say? What would he tell us? What would be his prescription? Would he have one for this time in which we're living that's any different from sort of what he did his entire life? I'll jump in because I think um, certainly there's a legislative agenda. What I heard him say again and again, deep into June of last year, was as terrible as things are, come walk in my shoes. If you don't think America can get better, come walk in my shoes. So a disenfranchised great grandson of a slave dies a hero of the Republic. And that's not to make it all about him, but it does show that there is an innate moral impulse. This is your job, this is your business. Uh, an innate moral impulse to live in closer accord with ideals of love and charity and grace. And he did it. And so I think what he would, I think what he would say is sanctity of the vote, the, you keep an eye on all your lawmakers, policing reform. I think there'd be any, any number of things, guns, as we, which is top of mind again, yet again today. Um, but it's, there's a principle that runs through it, and the principle is we have an ideal. The question is how far are we going to settle from that ideal? Mm. or can we go closer to it? Mm. And I'd argue that the man who led us across the Edmund mm. Pettus Bridge got closer to that ideal than anybody else. I, I, I know what comes to my mind is uh, every time he would say this, hate is too heavy a burden to bear. Mm. And that for me was always the way forward um, whenever he talked about love and peace every day every day with his colleagues on the floor. I mean, he did not hesitate to talk about love and peace. When someone would ask, you know, about your, my children, how would I, what do I tell my children? Love is the way, peace. Those are the things he talked over and over again. And, and, and they were words powerful enough that you had an opportunity to look at him and see the example on really what they meant and how you get there. And he could say them and mean them because he'd done them. Exactly. Right. Linda, anything you'd add there? I don't think I could, I don't think I could add anything to that. <laughs> I think that's, that's exactly right. Um, a couple of questions that are sort of related to, to where we are today, again. Um, Jane is curious about how the congressman would have felt about the current activism of powerful black women like Stacey Abrams and Alicia Garza, which leads me to wonder who are the, the people that, in addition to John when he showed up on television, who were the people that Congressman Lewis was excited about listening to, right? Who did he perk up around? Who did he say, oh, that person? There's, and I, I understand there were probably many of them because he was so generous, but are there particular people who he, he would point us to? I don't know if there would be, I don't know if there are particular people, but I know that he uh, would be excited about people who were courageous, 
who were creative, who were determined. He, lo he looked beneath the surface. And um, I know to Linda's point, uh, pointing out individuals would not be the right thing to do. But there were so many people that he believed in and, and their leadership and what they stood for. So he was, would you, say, would you all say that he was pleased with some of the young new leadership that was coming up in, in this country and that he felt good about it? Yeah, many people would try to you know, ask him, who is the new leader? Who is the new John Lewis? Who is the right. new Martin Luther King? And he, I, I, he would clearly say there's not just one. There, there are so many young people that are talented and active, and he just wanted to see people get in the way and, and get in good trouble, Causing necessary good trouble, trouble yeah. and make sure you know, that they were being respectful and mindful and understanding history. That was key. You know, I think for young people, the one thing he would tell, he always used to tell people when he would travel, you got to know your history. You have to go back. You know, he would talk about eyes and the prize. You know, learn the lessons of the civil rights movement. Understand how we did it. We just didn't show up one day, you know, we didn't. And so you got to understand your history in order to go forward. Another thing he would say is to be authentic as he was. So uh, the, you, again, I go back to those core values, know what they are, stick to them. Um, but when you are authentic, you are able to make people comfortable. And even if they don't agree with you, they're going to respect you because they know where you're coming from. That's where the position that you've always taken. It makes sense. It is aligned with your core values. Um, so even if I don't like what you have to say, I'm going to respect you and I'm going to trust you. And that gets you a long way as a, as a leader. Well, that's a, a, a good wrap on the questions that we have coming in. So, uh, Dean, I don't know if you want to invite final thoughts or if you have a, another plan for how we wrap up this really extraordinary conversation. Well, I'm just so grateful for all of you for joining us for this conversation. And uh, we'd scratch the surface of, of so many other things we could talk about. But um, I think I think we've had some, some, done some good work here tonight. Do you all have anything? How about a, a last word from each of you, something that you might want to share or send us off with? <laughs> well, I'll just take quickly. I, I have two biographical tricks, only two, and so I shouldn't give them both away, I guess. But uh, one is to ask someone what their first memory is, which we talked about, his mother's garden. The other is what do you dream about? And again, this was late. This was June. And he said... I dream about the marches. And I jumped in and said, do you dream about the violence? You know, does Jim Clark, does Bull Connor? And he said, no. And I could tell he was thinking about it. Um, I'm an unpaid therapist as well. So that, that's, part of, that's part of what happens. Uh, and he said, I, I dream about the moving feet. I hear the feet and I hear the songs and I see the light. It's always sunny. And then I'll wake up and I'll think, oh, that's just a dream. But we have to all work so that it's not just a dream. Anything you all would like to send us out with? I think that's a great sentence. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's John Lewis, of course, <laughs> okay, as ever, closing yeah, it out. Yeah, I remember that. Well, I, I think um, I'd just like to say to end with that um, one of the things that's most gratifying for me as uh, a Christian and as a clergyman is to see um, a politician who served for so many years, who was yet so deeply committed to his faith and that that faith was so um, authentically genuine, you know. And that um, to hear you both talk about and to make it was so clear in the book that he, I think the, the bravest thing he did was to hold on to this idea of love for his entire life. That love was the way, that peace was the way. And that to, to, to cling to that through the ups and the downs, the good and the bad, 
um, that takes immense bravery, it seems to me. That's why I was so curious to know if he ever got jaded, if he ever, you know, because it's, uh, it's an amazing thing. And that's one of the great lessons that I'm taking from his life, um, is that he was not only willing to walk that way of love, but to cling to it from the day he stepped out into the public world to the day he died. And um, I give God thanks for that life. And I give God thanks for all of you for joining us this evening. Thank you for being with us, and thank you for your questions. And um, um, God bless all of you. Now, may we go from this place and from this time to find rest and recreation, that we might rise to serve our Lord again tomorrow. So God bless and keep you. Thank you. Good night.